today on CityCast Pittsburgh. The city is looking to make some zoning changes, which could be a win for housing advocates. A new record number of Pennsylvanians are enrolled in SNAP, and there's a bill in our state legislature that would require kids to learn cursive writing. We're comparing our handwritten notes, plus diving deep into the history and lore of Punxsutawney Phil. It's January 26th, the Friday News Roundup. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. I'm with CityCast Sophia Lowe and Mary Lee Williams. How are y'all doing? I'm doing good. Hi, Megan. Hi. I'm also doing good. Excited to be here with both of you. You too. Thank you so much for fitting this in. It's been a busy week. Um, I, for one, am looking forward to the weekend. Yes, I am planning on reading a book. Uh, I'm also planning on meal prepping so that I am better at feeding myself during the work week. Constant struggle. Because I know you're very much an ingredients household. (laughs) Do you know what you're making yet? (laughs) Yes. Uh, Well, a classic is a chickpea salad. It's very easy to make. It stays very well. Or a pre-made like pasta salad. I just love carbs and like briny olives together. Olives. Mary Lee, we just uh, right off mic, we're talking about Mary Lee's familial love of olives. (laughs) It's a longstanding obsession. Like, all I don't know if it's something in our blood that we just like I just could eat olives with every meal like any olive (laughs) so what news have y'all seen popping up this week Mary Lee you want to kick us off yeah I mean there is one development about a story or an issue that we've been following a lot it has to do with the zoning board yeah we have talked about zoning issues here in Pittsburgh a lot of times on this show. I think the most recent one was after there was a problem with the housing development in Bloomfield. And before that, the one in the East End around the old Irish Center property, it can be really, really tough to get through the city's zoning board of adjustments, which I guess can be like a good or bad thing depending where you fall. But it definitely makes new housing in Pittsburgh kind of tougher to see through. Yeah, well, council's been talking about zoning particularly zoning for housing for a couple months now. And this week, one of our Northside counselors, Bobby Wilson, he introduced legislation that would amend the city's zoning code for a certain kind of home. Yeah. Attached dwellings is how it reads, um, a.k.a. row houses or townhomes. Yeah. Which Pittsburgh has like a long tradition of having these row houses. I actually live in one. Uh, I am living that like attached house lifestyle. (laughs) Um, If anyone is like, oh, I don't think I would want to live that close to my neighbors. It's really not an issue. I've never had a problem. I think it kind of say that your neighbors don't stay there full time. So your house is colder. Yeah. I mean, like the function of a row house when it was built obviously varies. But like one of the benefits of living in an older row house or older set of them is like when everyone's here in the winter, everyone's homes are heated. So like you kind of stay warm and it insulates you a little bit. But like where you live and who your neighbors are depends. On one side, yes, some of my neighbors are not here (laughs) during the winter. On the other side, I'm like friends with my neighbor. And so that's really fun. So like once I heard the Bella's lullaby from Twilight on... (laughs) in her house and I texted her because I was like are you watching Twilight I got so excited so like it's cool to live in yeah it's fun to live in a row house if you're like if you know your neighbors and you're close with them I I just want to make sure we're giving a clear picture of the upsides and the down it's true Um, we've got to be balanced (laughs) Wilson's office said that this uh, legislation is going to remove some red tape for folks who want to build on smaller lots or even bigger ones like it would still be easier if they're over 35 feet Um, they may be subject to review it looks like eight of nine of our city councilors have signed on to it and Wilson has been sharing quotes from folks in Ganey's administration which suggests to me that they are on board with this too um So it sounds like it's likely to pass. Uh, Yeah, it's going to go to the planning commission first, then back to standing committee, then to then a council vote and then to the mayor. And that's all if nothing gets in the way. So let's jump into some bigger stories this week. Megan, what caught your attention? I have been watching the number of folks receiving SNAP benefits took up for months now. And a few stories popped up recently that says we're now at record enrollment. The previous record, I guess, was set last July. um, But now uh, the most recent data we have says more than 2 million Pennsylvanians are in the program. 
Uh, has other reporting shared why enrollment is going up? I'm going to guess that part of it has to do with how expensive groceries are now. Yeah, I think that's definitely a, one reason. Um, but there's a bunch of them. Inflation, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. Um, if In case you missed it, one of our recent Friday shows, we talked about groceries and just like how expensive they are, especially leading into the holidays. Oh, yeah, for sure. I was on that show and I still lament the prices of groceries every time <laughs> I go to the grocery store, Fair even when enough. I try to shop cheaply. But I know that this wasn't quite as recent, but I remember seeing that in 2022, more people were eligible to register for SNAP. And this was Mm -hmm. because the income threshold was like expanded. And that meant that 420,000 more Pennsylvanians could actually get access to this like supplemental nutrition benefit. Yeah. And I guess this is a little bit of a soapbox. But Sophie, I I think it's just like a really complicated question. Like everything Mm -hmm. is so much more expensive right now. Um, And not everyone has access to healthy or culturally relevant food. We talk about that a lot in Pittsburgh, like this concept of a food desert and having Mm -hmm. a grocery store in your neighborhood. Um, Maybe you lack access to medical care or maybe you've had way too much medical care and now you have a lot of debt. Disability status plays a role. Housing, of course, is a huge cost for people, even here in Pittsburgh, where our prices tend to be a little bit lower by the national average. Um, And then I think it is worth saying, too, like even historical wrongs, like the division of who could buy a home where and accumulate some generational wealth. Um, Like from a policy perspective, we talk about food access and food insecurity like it's a reflection of choice a lot of the time. But I think for millions of Americans, that is just not true. Yeah. And you were talking about places that don't have grocery stores, Megan. I know it's a really big deal that Salim's is going to the Hill District and that that's a neighborhood that's finally going to have a grocery store again for the first time in years. Mm -hmm. The grocery store that's been open in the Strip District for a very long time, um, expanding to the Hill. That's really exciting. I, I know they've really been missing the shop and save the closed a while ago. And just to clarify, SNAP, which used to be called food stamps, it's a federal program. It represents a whole country. And what gets covered is also decided by the feds, like what foods qualify and maybe what foods don't, how much of it you can have, that kind of stuff. And products, not just food, hemp, tampons, but eligibility stuff like income requirements, that that's all set by the state. And this isn't just one single number. I'm poking around at the Pennsylvania numbers now, uh, the maximum gross monthly income to qualify for SNAP depends on things like how many people are in your household. Uh, So, for example, like one person, the max monthly income is $2,430. And then a four-person household, that number would be $5,000. And like if you hear those numbers and you're like, oh, man, maybe I'll qualify for this, uh, you should apply. At least see if you qualify, because mm-hmm. these are benefits that you are entitled to. So like, yeah, I it's just part want... of our tax dollars. Take advantage of it if you can. If you can. Uh, but if you want to apply, there is an online portal. It's called Compass. We'll make sure that we include the link to it in our show notes. And you can also go in person to some county assistance offices where they can help you. They have nine of those offices throughout the county. Yeah. And another group that I know helps with these applications is the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank. So there's a page on their website that explains like what information you need to apply. Uh, You can even leave your contact information and someone from the org will uh, walk you through the process of applying over the phone. And just one more, too. um, Just Harvest is an anti-hunger organization in the South Side that I think really punches above its weight in the advocacy world. They have a five minute screener that they do um, and a Google form that can help folks, you know, with the application and anything else they might qualify for, too. So like TANF or WIC or Medicaid. Um, I think they're just such a cool organization. And actually, while you're on their website, also consider their free tax prep program. Um, Tis the season for all that. Um, They've been doing that service for over 20 years. um, And there are a lot of tax credits that a lot of lower income folks may qualify for. And they know about them and can help you get them. Um, And they, you know, on their website, it says, you know, that they believe strongly that people who are already struggling should be able to skip the commercial tax preparing process and keep their whole refund because they need it. Um, So once again, bunch of resources, we will put all those links in our show notes. And if you do receive SNAP benefits, any other additional benefits, like keep up with your paperwork because there are renewals, there are things that you have to do to keep receiving them. So don't forget about that. Most of these organizations can help with that too. So Mary Lee, what about you? What have you been following this week? 
Well, there is a bill that's in our state legislature that I heard about, and it just made me giggle, uh, and I just really (laughs) wanted to share it. (laughs) Okay. What is it? It would require cursive handwriting be taught in Pennsylvania schools. And I'm curious, did you guys learn cursive in school? I did when I was in school in Mississippi and Louisiana. I did in Tennessee, and I've heard anecdotally, I asked around um, when we were laughing about this, I forgot it was going to be on today's show, uh, that some Pennsylvania schools at least required it in like the 80s, 90s, early aughts. <laughs> I learned cursive in New Jersey public schools, early 2000s. Um, also had like, you know, computer class that focused on proper typing skills for parts yes, of it. I remember those. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, I didn't realize like that it wasn't a requirement to teach cursive in schools in Pennsylvania. But now that I'm thinking about it, I have no idea if it was a requirement in New Jersey, too, or if my school just did it. Me either. My school definitely did it. And apparently it is the law there now, but I couldn't quickly figure out exactly when it became a thing. Like if we were just early adopters or if it's been required all this time. So if Pennsylvania didn't require this before, what's the reasoning to get it in classrooms now? Um, The primary sponsor is Joe Adams, who represents parts of Wayne County and Pike County. That's on the other side of the state and like up north. Both counties border New York and Pike County actually also shares a border with New Jersey. In case anyone was very specific and wanted to know exactly where where these counties are. Maybe this is where he got the idea is from from Sophia's school. (laughs) (laughs) He was just over over in New Jersey and was like, hey, this is it. But actually, so... uh, Whenever you introduce legislation, you put out a memo, and that's kind of where you can find out why politicians want to do things. Sometimes the memos are very detailed. Sometimes they're not. But in this memo, he does lay out some of his reasoning. So he says that cursive supports some developmental milestones. He says that there are some cognitive benefits to this and that it's still relevant and practical to learn cursive. And my favorite part of this memo that he put out It was about how cursive is still practical today. And he said it's because people need to sign documents, which like fair. You got me there. Okay, okay, a signature. But that's not like learning to write in cursive like writ large. True. But the other one is that is that you need to learn cursive so that you can read historical texts like the Declaration of Independence. Wait, (laughs) that's like like named example. The the example is Declaration of Independence. (laughs) It's like you can't read the Declaration of Independence in person. It's an old document. (laughs) Yeah, it's not because it's in cursive. It's just because it's old. Also, like, you're reading it from a textbook or learning about it online. Like, no one's looking at the original document ever. Yeah. Well, he said, like, historical documents and then gave the Declaration of Independence as an example. But, like, I see the point. I mean, like, your signature is still really important, but I truly don't know how practical it is because I don't know anyone that writes in perfect cursive anymore. Like most people just have some type of like Frankenstein's monster between that's like print and cursive. Like I don't know anyone that's doing straight cursive anymore. Well, I guess you can't do that Frankenstein if you don't know cursive. I mean, I'm thinking of like doctors and lawyers signatures where it's like it just sort of looks like a squiggle if you're lucky. Well, I think my handwriting's cute, so I'm going to show it off. This is my notebook. <laughs> some cursive stuff, some print stuff. I don't know how legible it is, but I just think it looks nice, like from far away. Like it's aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. So for listeners, we're on the equivalent of a Zoom call. OK, I can read that. That's cute. I like it. You got popular girl handwriting. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. I thought Sophia had popular girl <laughs> handwriting. I'm not doing like the hearts over my eyes or anything, though. I want people to know that. No, no, no. no. But it's like the the kind of the it's combo between organized. like scripty, but also like print. And it's a little bubbly kind of. Yeah. It's, it's good. It's good. <laughs> it's cute. Okay. Actually, I want to do this as a test. So I guess Mary Lee and I and uh, producer Elizabeth, who's hanging out with us behind the scenes. Uh, let's write something. Let's do a little test. Do your signature. Let's see. I, f- I feel okay. like a phrase. Um, let's do today on CityCast Pittsburgh. So t- like like Fair. write that out in cursive and then a number like you would on a checkbook. So like spelled out 412, 412. Um, and then hold up your piece of paper. I want to see what this looks like. Wait, you want me to write 412 in <laughs> letters? <laughs> yes, like a check. <gasps> Megan, that is so many letters. <laughs> 
I like that you're complaining about the number, but not today on CityCast Pittsburgh. Well, somehow that feels shorter. Elizabeth, <laughs> yours looks like a third grader. <laughs> It's beautiful. It's stunning. It's gorgeous. You unicorn. Elizabeth, your first name just looks like you fit every letter in the alphabet <laughs> in it. <laughs> I mean, the word as a Megan Elizabeth, you kind of have to. <laughs> it does have a lot of letters. Mary Lee, Mary Lee you go next. Uh, my signature is is kind of insane. It just it starts out really strong and then it just becomes nothing. I really focus on the Williams here. That's true. It's sort of a Z with a line and another line, perplexingly. Well, it's because it's because there are two eyes, but <laughs> making two dots is too. I feel like the other stuff is pretty strong. No, the rest like, of it's good. But the I do do a cursive F. Like four is basically almost all cursive. It's too much work to pick up your pen. True, it is too much work to pick up your pen. I will give cursive that. It is nice. Farsi, which I'm learning, is all like a cursive-y script. Oh, so you're getting more practice right now. It's true. I could write one of these in Farsi if you want to see it. Here, I'll hold up mine while Mary Lee's writing. I am not super proud of it. Oh, that's like tight. Oh, you keep that tight. That feels the most cursive-y. I like the loops. Like the C's and city casts are big. Oh, I don't like that you're writing like not on the lines. You're writing in like the opposite direction. Yes, I'm hard Pisces. I never follow the rules in that way. Your the capital P you have is very big. I like a dramatic capital letter, you know? That is a really big P. Okay, there you go. That's what Farsi looks like. I don't know if that's good handwriting for Farsi, but it looks lovely. This is another note. Sophia, I think you win. It like it's very it's very curvy. Mm-hmm. I like it. Uh, uh okay, so where is this legislation at? Uh so everyone drum roll please. To no one's surprise, it is in committee. Sounds right. <laughs> Yay. It was referred to the Education Committee. So, like, we'll keep you posted if it seems like it's going to move through and is likely to pass. Last up, Sophia, I am very excited because you have been teasing us with this story for days. Yes, you're welcome in advance, everyone. <laughs> I'm very excited about this. Uh, we are one week away from February 2nd, which is Groundhog Day. I didn't know that you were this into the Groundhog Day. I this is this has just been great to behold. I am less into the Groundhog Day and more into Phil Lore, to be specific. <laughs> <laughs> I really love fuzzy little creatures like groundhogs. And I also keep my eyes out for groundhogs when I'm wandering around the Allegheny Cemetery. I spotted a few in the fall. I, I'm, I'm sure they don't disappoint you. Yeah. Uh, remind us, what is Groundhog Day? Yes. Well, Punxsutawney Phil, a groundhog, will let us know whether spring is coming soon or we can expect more dreary winter days. At this point, I'm usually ready for spring, but we got what I really feel like is our first real snow, so I wouldn't be too upset with more winter. I want more winter. I know that Punxsutawney is a place, and this place <laughs> is actually not that far from Pittsburgh. It's like an hour and a half away, and like to be honest, if you can't tell by the way I started that sentence, before I moved here, I thought Punxsutawney was made up. I legit <laughs> did not think it was a real place. So I'm happy that you are invested in this Pennsylvania tradition. What can I say? I love fuzzy little creatures and I am still a fan of silly traditions, even if I am more groundhog forward. Um, but <laughs> PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, is not a fan of Groundhog Day. They actually wrote to the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club. That's the group that runs Groundhog Day. They have the Inner Circle, a bunch of other fancy titles, and they take care of the <laughs> groundhog year round. And PETA suggested switching out Phil for... A uh, giant coin toss. Giant? <laughs> what? Like Wait, a giant coin. coin. Like, like the coin flipping a coin instead of seeing about the shadow? 
Yes. I mean, the odds are probably the same. W- w- I forget which it is. What If he sees the shadow, there's a thing. And if he doesn't see his shadow, it's a thing. Which one is it? Okay, okay. So if Phil sees his shadow, <laughs> that means that winter's going to go on for six more weeks. And if okay. Phil doesn't see his shadow, spring will arrive early, which I think is weird. Like, he'll see a shadow if it's sunny. And doesn't that mean, like, warm weather? But what do I know? I'm not a meteorologist or a groundhog, I mean, neither I guess. is Phil. I don't know. I mean, the <laughs> coin will probably be just as accurate as Phil. I'm just going to throw that one out there. But I also need... I actually to- just Googled that, Mary Lee. Apparently, the accuracy rate, depending on the outlet you're looking at for Phil, is approximately 40%. So the coin is better. <laughs> but the coin's not fuzzy. <laughs> Sophia, we can make that coin fuzzy. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds scary. No, thank you. Yeah, back to this, like, what'd you say? Would you call it a fan club of some kind? The inner circle, Megan. That's it, it the inner circle. <laughs> oh, that's just like a fancy word for all of the people that kind of run the Groundhog Day tradition, um, plan other events during the year, and take care of Phil um, on the celebration February 2nd. You'll see them all in, like, top hats and stuff. Oh, I thought this was a cult. I, <laughs> I didn't think it was a cult, but I didn't know what they were called. But again, let's let's even get more into the meat. So what like can you dig in a little bit more to swapping him out for a coin? Like a groundhog and a coin are obviously not the same thing as you have pointed out, not fuzzy. <laughs> fuzzy versus non-fuzzy, the only difference to me. Um but Peta's release, uh Peta has pointed out that like we've touched on, Phil isn't an accurate weather predictor and a coin flip would have better odds, but they're also concerned about the general treatment of Phil. In this year's release, they said he, quote, deserves better than to be exploited every year for tourism money, end quote. So um, he's kept in an enclosure in the library, so Phil obviously doesn't get to live in the wild like a usual groundhog and do groundhog activities like burrow around. Pete has also pointed out that groundhogs are shy animals, and Phil, well, he's definitely getting a lot of attention on this day and being around crowds and all of that. And another part of this complaint is that it's winter. It's typically the time that groundhogs would be hibernating, but Phil is out and about giving this fake weather update. And this isn't the first time that PETA's advocated for um, getting Phil out of this uh, situation and into a sanctuary. They've suggested a few other traditions uh, for Groundhog Day instead. Like what What, what kind of traditions? Um, so last year they offered to send a Phil philanthropist to live in Phil's library enclosure <laughs> for a year and also <laughs> make a weather prediction. Like Wha- a human would live in the enclosure? Yes, and they could make the prediction while wearing a groundhog costume. That seems somehow worse. Excellent. Yes, exactly. My thought, too. And in 2020, they wrote about using an animatronic groundhog to predict the weather using AI. So I guess that would actually be more accurate. But like, Dang, I don't know. I'll give them points for creativity. Look, PETA is nothing but a creative organization, I would argue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a little confused about why they do do this every year, I guess, you know big day, but I feel like there are much more important animal cruelty issues to address instead of one groundhog. It also seems like this one gets treated pretty well, by and large. Yeah. Like he gets a lot of attention. I know cameras maybe aren't like the nicest thing, but he seems yeah. like the rest of the year he lives a pretty good life. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time on the website, um, and he gets a nice diet of like fruits and veggies. He did get a cavity once because he ate too many treats, so he saw like a Aww. dentist. Like... He might get his teeth checked out more often than I do. Who knows? You earlier you mentioned lore. So like what what kind of groundhog lore did you dig up? Yes, Phil Facts. My name for it. Um, So there's two FAQs on the Groundhog Club's website. One is like questions about how to see like his shadow prediction and person um that's all fine the fun one is the phil lore um we'll link in the show notes um first and foremost my favorite fact is that the club asserts that phil has always been correct in his weather predictions so this is how the whole process works he gives his prediction to the club's president in groundhog ease and the website (laughs) says that the club president is the only person who can understand the language so to me this implies that if the prediction is wrong it's the president's fault for having a faulty grasp (laughs) of the language 
<laughs> yeah, it's always human error. Sure, got it. <laughs> the president hasn't fully immersed immersed himself in groundhog ease, so clearly that's where the issue is. Yeah, needs a new class. No class, just magic, I guess. Because, you know, CityCast has done an episode about Groundhog Day, and I brought back a clip from that from when we talked to Phil's handler, who explained more about how the president learns groundhoggies. It wouldn't, well, it's not natural to anyone except for the president, and they're able to interpret it through their possession of, you know, how they think it goes down. But really, I pull him out of his stump, I set him on the stump. Phil and Phil alone decides whether or not he's seen his shadow, and then he communicates that you know, his his findings to the president of the Groundhog Club. He's the only person in the world that can interpret groundhog ease. How, how long did it take to uh, to learn that language or is it natural in Punxsutawney? It wouldn't. Well, it's not natural to anyone except for the president. And they're able to interpret it through the possession of the this ancient acacia wood cane. It's a wooden walking cane that's been passed down from president to president. And through the possession of that cane, that's what gives you those abilities. But it's kind of like the sword and the stone, you know, like you or I might pick that cane up and, you know, you might start, you might look at Phil and he starts twitching his nose. And you, if you recognize what he's saying, then you would be the, probably be the next in line to be the president of the Groundhog Club. I pick up that cane and it's just like another walking cane. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's kind of how that works. (laughs) So the cane the cane does it? <laughs> you gotta believe in the magic, Mary Lee. The magic of the cane. The magic of the cane. I would I I really feel like since they wear those silly hats, it should be the hat. Well, they all wear silly hats, so yes, but then it wouldn't just be the president who knows groundhoggies, and I guess that makes it less special. I don't know. I mean, maybe if more people knew groundhoggies, we wouldn't have a prediction problem. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, One other thing that I want everyone to know is Phil is canonically the same Phil since Groundhog Day first started. Apparently, he has a little sip of an elixir that gives him longer life. His wife, (laughs) her name is Phyllis, does not get this elixir. I have follow-up questions to that. Does that mean that Phyllis has been replaced over the years? Does Phil know about it? Does he mourn his former wives? Who knows? I feel like the more you tell me about these lore things, the more I'm kind of getting on PETA's side now. (laughs) I mean, anecdotally, though, I feel like I've heard that groundhogs are like, you know, as critters, like kind of fragile. Like, do you all remember that story of de Blasio dropping the one in New York and it died right after that? Like, they just don't live that long. There was an NPR story I remember from when, um, what was his name? Milltown Mel died. Um, He was the New Jersey groundhog. Oh, God. Um, but he was like, yeah, they just don't live like past three or four years in the wild and eight to 12 in captivity. I'm pulling up this NPR story now. The Jersey people insist that they had two that lived past 20 years. But either way, that means that Phil has needed to be replaced a few times once in a while. Do those numbers make you less on PETA side, Mary Lee? I don't know. I feel like if they live that long in captivity, that means something's going right. I I mean, like, I don't know. It's mostly just that you said that he has to mourn multiple wives. That just made me (laughs) feel really bad. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry I made this dark. Um, I can end with a high note. Yes, you get yes, one please. more Phil fact, and everyone needs to know that fact is spelled with a P-H. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> We're looking at Sophia's notes in real time. It's amazing. Uh, but then you're cut off. Okay. And we will also have links in the show notes for anyone else that wants some more Phil facts. <laughs> um, last one, like I said, happier one, quick one. Phil apparently likes to spend his days reading the newspaper. So I hope someone subscribed him to Hey Pittsburgh or plays in this Aww. podcast. Well, if you want to celebrate Groundhog Day, uh, you can make the 90-minute drive to Gobbler's Knob, which, uh, gosh, the silliness of that name is a separate issue, uh, (laughs) where Honksatani Phil makes his weather predictions every year. I do have friends who've actually made that pilgrimage. They raved about it. They said it was actually a lot of fun, um, and the weather was terrible the year they went. Um, Phil also travels around the state. Um, We just missed him, apparently, here in Pittsburgh. He was at Wiggle Whiskey over the weekend. But we will shout the next time that we hear about him in our area or maybe we'll say something in, in uh, groundhog ease <laughs> we can't understand it we don't have the cane no cane i'll get that cane lastly uh where will we see a city caster this weekend mary lee kick us off well 
Unless you're in my home for most of the weekend, you probably <laughs> <laughs> you probably won't be seeing me a lot of places. Uh, but I think I might be going to Jellyfish this Saturday. If you guys haven't been to Jellyfish uh, and you live in Pittsburgh and you like dancing, I could not recommend a cool dance night more. Jellyfish is awesome. You can follow them on Instagram. Sophia, what about you? Like Mary Lee, I will mostly be inside, but honestly, I looked at the weather. It's supposed to be a little warmer this weekend, so I might be wandering around trying to go to Frick Park if it's not too wet. Now I kind of want to go to the cemetery and look for groundhogs, but they're probably (laughs) all hibernating now. Well, this is finally my weekend for Crapteca, the junk food fest, sort of, at the vegan restaurant Apteca on Penn Avenue. And good timing for me because the chefs just got shortlisted for a James Beard again, a semifinalist spot. So that's super cool. Good luck in the line for Crapteca. At least it's not 20 degrees. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. Our music is by Benji. Mary Lee Williams is our executive producer. Sophia Lowe and Elizabeth Kama produced the show. Francesca DeBecco wrote our newsletter. And I'm your host, Megan Harris. We will be back on Monday with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend, everyone. Is it Groundhog or Groundhogs? I was about to say, is it Groundhogs? It's Groundhog it's Day. Is it Groundhog Day? Groundhog's Day is the movie? Question mark.